Preparation for the Kingdom Section I Introduction Christ vs. Lucifer Many centuries ago two very powerful beings met on top of a high mountain. One showed the other all the kingdoms of the world, and said if you will serve me, all this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will give it. But the master of the two would later explain that, what is a man profited, if he shall gain the whole world, and lose his own soul? Pharaoh, in his life of Christ, gives an example of such a person. There was one living who, scarcely in a figure, might be said to have the whole world. The Fabian Emperor Tiberius was at that moment infinitely the most powerful of living men, the absolute, undisputed, deified ruler of all that was fairest and richest in the kingdoms of the earth. There was no control to his power, no limit to his wealth, no restraint upon his pleasures. And to yield himself still more unreservedly to the boundless self-gratification of a voluptuous luxury, not long after this time he chose for himself a home on one of the loveliest spots on the earth's surface, under the shadow of the slumbering volcano, upon an enchanting islet in one of the most softly delicious climates of the world. What came of it all? He was, as Pliny calls him, confessedly the most gloomy of mankind. Picture the great Emperor Tiberius is pictured on a Roman coin mankind have generally had the opinion that money would bring happiness, but this is a deception. The Prophet Joseph Smith gave the key to happiness when he said, Happiness is the object and design of our existence, and will be the end thereof, if we pursue the path that leads to it. And this path is virtue, uprightness, faithfulness, holiness, and keeping all the commandments of God. But we cannot keep all the commandments without first knowing them, and we cannot expect to know all, or more than we now know unless we comply with or keep those we have already received. If we seek first the kingdom of God, all good things will be added. But in obedience there is joy and peace unspotted, unalloyed. And as God has designed our happiness and dash and the happiness of all his creatures, he never has and dash he never will institute an ordinance or give a commandment to his people that is not calculated in its nature to promote that happiness which he has designed and which will not end in the greatest amount of good and glory to those who become the recipients of his law and ordinances. Christ and Satan represent the two spiritual powers that control this world, but it often seems that Satan has the upper hand. He attempts to divert our attention to everything except the laws of God. The material things of this world are his greatest tools. He disguises sin to make it appear good, and good to appear evil. There is a story told of a man in a restaurant eating alone at a table, and a fine-looking gentleman came up and said, Pardon me, sir and dash since all the tables seem to be full, I was wondering if you would permit me to share your table with you. Certainly, said the man. Then considering it to be polite to visit with him, he asked the visitor who he was. I am the devil, he replied rather casually. Thinking it was some kind of joke, he decided to go along with it and continued with, Tell me. Sir, how is your work doing no days? Oh, wonderful, exclaimed the devil. Formerly we used torture and even death to force people to do my will, but we weren't too successful. So we decided to change our tactics. We now tempt and lure men by offering them riches and rewards and power. We make evil appear beautiful, proper and in vogue. We change the appearance of saloons into beautiful casinos. We made whorehouses into the most luxurious hotels. And we made gambling, drugs, Sabbath breaking and dash in fact everything evil and dash into something popular and accepted. My work today is prospering as never before. Deceptions and temptations many kinds of temptations are strewn over the pathway of life. One, familiar to all societies, is pointed out by wise old Solomon who warns of the danger of lust. Proverbs chapter 7, 1-27 1 My son, keep my words, and lay out my commandments with thee. 2 Keep my commandments, and live, and my law is the apple of thine eye. 3 Bind them upon thy fingers, write them upon the table of thine heart. 4 Say unto wisdom, Thou art my sister, and call understanding thy kinswoman. 5 That they may keep thee from the strange woman, from the stranger which flattereth with her words. 6 4 at the window of my house I looked through my casement. 7 and behold among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths, a young man void of understanding. 8 passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house. 9 in the twilight, 
in the evening, in the black and dark night. 10. And, behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot, and subtil of heart. 11. She is loud and stubborn. Her feet abide not in her house. 12. Now is she without, now in the streets, and leeth in wait at every corner. 13. So she caught him, and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, 14. I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. 15. Therefore came I forth to meet thee, diligently to seek thy face, and I have found thee. 16. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. 17. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. 18. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning, let us solace ourselves with loves. 19. For the goodman is not at home, he is gone a long journey. 20. He hath taken a bag of money with him, and will come home at the day appointed. 21. With her much fair speech she caused him to yield, with the flattering of her lips she forced him. 22. He goth up to her straightway, as an ox goeth to the slaughter, or as a fool to the correction of the stocks. 23. Till a dart strike through his liver, as a bird hasteth to the snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. 24. Hearken unto me now therefore, O your children, and attend to the words of my mouth. 25. Let not thine heart decline to her ways, go not astray in her paths. 26. For she hath cast down many wounded, yea, many strong men have been slain by her. 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. But lust is only one single temptation to lead men into sorrow and bondage. There are many others in dash each one brought about by the appearance of something other than what it really is. That is the deception of the devil. Everything presented to you that is, designed to take away your freedom, is like the beautiful red apple that the wicked queen presented to Snow White and Dash it is poison. It leads to bondage and slavery and Dash through voluntary submission to a power other than Christ's. Picture. Wicked witch giving Snow White an apple. Here. Take one of my lovely apples. Why else would John the beloved apostle describe Lucifer as that old serpent, called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world? Joseph F. Smith described the deception of the devil. We have been deceived. We thought that the devil had long horns and tail, a cloven foot, and was black, hideous, and grinning. But when we find him out, he is a gentleman in black broadcloth, with a smooth tongue, pleasant countenance, high forehead, and so on. Quite a good-looking fellow. That is the kind of a person we find the devil to be, and we will find him in more persons than one, and the two right in this city. Brigham Young also described the devil and his evil spirits. It requires all the care and faithfulness which we can exercise in order to keep the faith of the Lord Jesus. For there are invisible agencies around us in sufficient numbers to encourage the slightest disposition they may discover in us to forsake the true way, and fan into a flame the slightest spark of discontent and unbelief. The spirits of the ancient Gideontans are around us. You may see battlefield after battlefield, scattered over this American continent, where the wicked have slain the wicked. Their spirits are watching us continually for an opportunity to influence us to do evil, or to make us decline in the performance of our duties. And I will defy any man on earth to be more gentlemanly and bland in his manners than the master spirit of all evil. We call him the devil, a gentleman so smooth and so oily that he can almost deceive the very elect. We have been baptized by men having the authority of the holy priesthood of the Son of God, and consequently we have power over him which the rest of the world do not possess, and all who possess the power of the priesthood have the power and right to rebuke those evil powers, and they obey not, it is because we do not live so as to have the power with God, which it is our privilege to have. If we do not live for this privilege and right we are under condemnation. At the end of his ministry, Jesus took his disciples up on the mountain to warn them of the dangers that would come to the saints in the last days. Said he, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. For there shall arise false Christs, and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that, it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. 
from these passages in Matthew, we can conclude that end dash. 1. If it is possible that the elect are almost deceived, it means that all the rest of the world will be deceived. 2. The elect are very few in number. 3. The elect must leave the kingdoms of the world in order to gain a place in God's kingdom. But in order to prepare ourselves to be a part of God's kingdom, we have to learn the difference between Satan's kingdom and the kingdom of God. Satan's kingdom is sometimes called Babylon, so the next section will describe conditions existing therein. Section 2 Babylon The beautiful brief history Ancient Babylon was once the wonder of the world. Her beautiful buildings, hanging gardens, tremendous prosperity, and worldwide trade caused all the world to marvel at her magnificence. Babylon was a very successful commercial nation and its citizens had work and wealth. One thing, however, was lacking in dash and understanding and worship of the true God. Great evils and wickedness were widespread among the people, eventually causing the destruction and collapse of Babylon itself. Collier's National Encyclopedia gives an important history of this great city. Babylon, a celebrated city of antiquity, was situated on the Euphrates River. Babylon was strengthened and beautified by Hammurabi and his successors. Under Nebuch ad Nazar, 605-562, it reached its greatest splendor and magnificence. Nebuch ad Nazar who built a great wall around Babylon, paved the sacred way, restored the great temple of Marduk, and created the famous Hanging Gardens, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Their civilization was highly developed. They were skilled metal workers possessed the system of writing, dug numerous series of canals for irrigation purposes, and built palaces and tower temples of brick. The great Amorite king, Hammurabi, made himself master of all Mesopotamia through a series of brilliant victories, and founded the first Babylonian Empire. He codified the laws and customs of the country, reorganized the administration of justice, undertook huge irrigation projects, and consolidated his empire into a mighty unit. Under his beneficent rule, Babylonia experienced great prosperity. Trade, always a dominant feature of Babylonian life, flourished as never before. Under Sennacherib Assyria reached the height of her grandeur and power. She was now undisputed mistress of the Orient. For a time she even ruled Egypt. With the vast wealth that poured into her coffers, Nineveh, the capital city, was beautified. Magnificent palaces and imposing temples were erected, and all the arts were encouraged. Later a general usurped the throne and called himself Sargon II. He proved himself worthy of the name by further strengthening and expanding the already powerful empire. It was probably Sargon who took the lost ten tribes of Israel captives to Assyria. Ancient and modern Babylon compare the ways of Babylon are typified in the ways of today's world. The false gods, the lusts, the powerful businesses, and the love of wealth are much the same. Avraham Jalidi, in his band book called The Last Ace, mentions 12 die tribes of modern Israel. They are the forms of idolatry this people are guilty of. I have added comments to each of the 12 images. Images that turn away people's heart from God, such as images from television, movies, and videos violence and sex, murder, violence, and sexual indulgences are commonplace in our society. It is not only in the newspapers, but it is a form of our entertainment. Rock music. This is an adulterated form of music that takes over the mind and the body. The frenzy of wild antics displayed in rock music is descriptive of our modern insanity. Organized sports. The time, money and fanfare that goes into our sports would feed half the world. It is a replay of ancient Greece and Rome. Human idols. Religious leaders are the most guilty of this sin. It takes honor and glory from God, and they exhibit a covetousness for the honor and respect of other men. Imaginations of the heart. Studies or desires that draw us away from God are sins. 
Any desire that takes us away from faith in God is a vain imagination. Nature Cults Some of these nature freaks camp in the wilderness and act like the animals that are also out there. Many nature communes are only sexual parties. Mammon The riches of the world have always been the greatest temptation for man. Hardly a generation has passed that riches haven't blinded the people. Babylon The creation of many objects is not evil in itself but to promote them in sales pitches, color advertising and false values is an ancient evil. It is the opposite of Zion. The arm of flesh. Trusting in political and religious leaders instead of God is commonplace. The Lord has said that cursed are those that put their trust in the arm of flesh. Elitism Pharisaism This puts a peer group above the entire people instead of equal with them. Authority is a badge of superiority. Outwardly they may appear holy, but inwardly they are not. Pollution of the Temple This has been a common fault with every people who had a temple. They conform ceremonies to worldly standards, cut them down for expediency or introduce false doctrine into the ceremony. Many of the prophets of old were permitted to see our time and sent out prophetic warnings pertaining to these last days. How did they describe it? They said it was in the likeness of the great Babylon. It was the image of the plan that Satan presented in the pre-mortal world. Before we were born, we listened to two different programs presented for this earth. The devil's plan was not that he would let people kill, rob, rape, go to war and do evil. Absolutely not. Rather, he said, I am going to save everyone. I am going to make them obey. I am going to establish federal police, state police, city police, officers and agents. I'll issue thousands and thousands of laws, codes, statutes, rules and regulations for the people to obey. I will make people get licenses, permits, charters, and exemptions. They will need to be fingerprinted photographed, registered, and computerized. They will be identified in numerous ways including numbering. And, we are going to protect them by offering many different ways to get welfare, food stamps, grants, loans, aid and dash even foreign aid. And we will institute a complete taxing system to tax everyone except those who are on our welfare programs. The battle in the pre-mortal world is the same battle that exists in this mortal world. The contest is over man's free agency. Here are just seven of the ways that the devil has designed to make man give up his agency. Marriage contracts with the state anciently, and in the early days of the Mormon church, marriage was a sacred and religious ordinance. Eventually, however, lawyers and judges realized they could make money in marriage contracts, divorces, alimony and family inheritances. So they instigated marriage licenses and dash creating a three-way marriage with man, woman and the state. If the man and woman later decided to separate, it was necessary to call in the third member of the marriage for its approval and to determine the conditions of that separation. Bank signature card banks have big signs advertising free checking. This is just a carrot. The minute you sign that little yellow or blue card, you agree to comply with all the rules and regulations of that bank. Not one person in 10,000 ever reads all those regulations. One rule usually overlooked by the signer is that he has given the IRS the right to peek into his checking account any time they want to. In fact, the bank is just a bookkeeper for the Internal Revenue Service. If the IRS decides they have reason to take all of your savings, they can do so. You have no right to complain if they do, because you gave them permission when you signed the signature card. Driver's license the U.S. Constitution gives you the right to use public roads. But the state invented a little money-making program by giving you a little card to sign and dash a license saying you are voluntarily putting yourself under their jurisdiction. This permit gives you the privilege to use the public roads, which you already had the right to use anyway. 4. Free education The U.S. government has many free gifts, 
loans and grants for education. These subsidizing funds are available to most people who will fill out their forms and sign the documents, stating they will comply to certain regulations. Many people say we need the government funds, because the individuals don't have enough money and dash but where did the government get these funds? When students, teachers or schools sign up with the government, then they must conform to their regulations and programs. They must use government approved books, standards, curriculum and dash such as evolution, sex education, and atheism. Construction of government highways The same features pertaining to government-controlled schools also apply to the construction of highways. The government takes money from the people, then tells them they can have part of it back if they will conform to their rules and regulations regarding how, when and where to build roads in their states. Social Security The Social Security Department has declared that they have a voluntary system. No citizen is required to join up. But that something for nothing baloney indices people into a system that pays out only about one-sixth of what any good investment would pay. Signing up for a social security number is a plot to identify each citizen and sweep them into a federal agency by taking away the individual agency. The 1040 tax form even the IRS admits the income tax is based on voluntary compliance. However, they intimidate and frighten people into paying it. Again. Whenever people sign the 1040 form, they have given the IRS total jurisdiction over them and the money they earn. The voluntary part is then relinquished, and the individual then has no right to complain about IRS actions. There are hundreds of forms, papers, and documents for people to sign, social services, welfare, loans, credit cards, and many other benefits. By signing, people sometimes think they are getting something for nothing or at least at a reduced rate. But actually signing most documents means you are voluntarily giving up some of your freedoms and allowing others to have jurisdiction over you. By putting ourselves in these situations we have become a part of modern Babylon. Geographically, socially, economically, and spiritually, we have embraced Babylon. Therefore, if we continue on this path, we should not be surprised when we receive the rewards that are in store for Babylon. Section 3 The Kingdom of God Definition If we are to leave Babylon and search for the Kingdom of God, it is necessary to know what it is. For thousands of years many different and contradicting definitions of the Kingdom have been expounded. Some said that Kingdom has not yet come upon the earth. Others have said it was here only during the ministry of Christ. Or that it was only a spiritual Kingdom. Within the LDS Church there is also a difference of opinion. Bruce R. McConkie described it in dash, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints as it is now constituted is the Kingdom of God on Earth. Nothing more needs to be done to establish the Kingdom. On the other hand, Brigham Young explained in dash, as observed by one of the speakers this morning, that the Kingdom grows out of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but it is not the Church, for a man may be a legislator in that body which will issue laws to sustain the inhabitants of the Earth in their individual rights and still not belong to the Church of Jesus Christ at all. John Taylor began his book on this subject with the simplest and yet very comprehensive definition by saying, the Kingdom of God is the government of God, on the earth or in the heavens. Brigham Young had the same opinion. What is the Kingdom of God? When we talk about kingdoms, we talk about governments, rule, authority, power. For wherever there is a kingdom, these principles exist to greater or less extent. The nature and size of government may extend from a man's home, to a state, a nation, or even the world. Wherever or however extensive man's government may become, so can the kingdom of God and Ash but it can also extend to times and realms beyond this earth. Herbert W. Armstrong correctly analyzed the composition of a kingdom. Four things are necessary to constitute a kingdom. The territory, with its specific location and definite boundary lines. A king or supreme ruler or governing agent, ruling over subjects or citizens within that territorial jurisdiction, with laws and form of government. If any of these four vital elements are not present, there is not a correctly operative government or kingdom. Since God has a kingdom which is government, then Satan has a government which is his kingdom. These two kingdoms are mentioned by Christ when he said that in the last ace, nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. 
The decision for us is to determine which kingdom we are in. Let's suppose you were living with a band of robbers. You had a home there. You worked there. You complied with all their laws and did business with them. Who would believe you if you said you were a part of the kingdom of King George? Carrying the analogy a little further in dash let's say that you live in Babylon. You have a home there. You have a business there. You subscribed to all their laws and regulations. Your children went to their schools. You used their money, paid taxes to their leaders, and even voted for them. Who would believe you if you said you were really a member of the kingdom of God? In effect, we have that serious condition today. As true as relates into please God, we should make our exodus out of modern Egypt or Babylon. There are four major areas in which this should be accomplished. Geographical, social, economic, spiritual. The remainder of this section will be divided into those four areas. Geographically, Enoch gathered the people together and taught them to live a higher law than the rest of society. Jed gathered people away from the Tower of Babel so they could avoid catastrophe. Noah tried to gather people to the ark for a hundred and twenty years, and those that rejected his message suffered the consequence. Abraham was called to gather people out of the wicked cities so they could be saved. Moses was commanded to gather the Israelites out of the land of Egypt. Christ tried to gather people together and they failed to obey his call. Joseph Smith sent out the message that the believers should gather, and they did but only for a short while. He warned the people of his day. It was the design of the council of heaven before the world was, that the principles and laws of the priesthood should be predicated upon the gathering of the people in every age of the world. Jesus did everything to gather the people, and they would not be gathered, and he therefore poured out curses upon them. The requisite for a geographical posture of the saints came with the gospel restoration. It became one of the articles of our faith. 10. We believe in the literal gathering of Israel and in the restoration of the ten tribes. That Zion will be built upon this, the American continent. God made it clear that to get into his kingdom, we must get out of Babylon. The prophet Joseph made it clear that it was a part of our faith. One of the most important points in the faith of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, through the fullness of the everlasting gospel, is the gathering of Israel. This was certainly a principle with a purpose. Gathering was a golden thread weaving itself throughout the doctrine and covenants. So will I gather mine elect from the four quarters of the earth. Gather ye out from the eastern lands. A commandment I give unto all the churches, that they shall continue to gather together. The righteous shall be gathered out from among all nations, and shall come to Zion. And the remnant shall be gathered unto this place. Let the work of the gathering be not in haste, nor by flight. I will that my saints should be assembled upon the land of Zion. The city New Jerusalem shall be built by the gathering of the saints. That the work of the gathering together of my saints may continue. Gather yourselves together unto the land of Zion. Gather together for the redemption of my people. Go ye forth unto the land of Zion and dash that her stakes may be strengthened. I must gather together my people according to the parable of the wheat and the tears. That ye may be gathered in one, that ye may be my people and I will be your God. That the gathering together upon the land of Zion, and upon her stakes may be for a defense and for a refuge from the storm and from wrath when it shall be poured out without mixture upon the whole earth. One passage from this book of scripture seems to summarize better than all the others the purpose and importance of the principle of gathering. And ye are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect. For mine elect hear my voice and harden not their hearts. Wherefore the decree hath gone forth from the Father that they shall be gathered in unto one place upon the face of this land, to prepare their hearts and be prepared in all things against the day when tribulation and desolation are sent forth upon the wicked. The following important highlights can be gleaned from this paragraph. The elect are together. They gather to one place. They are together in this nation. They are to prepare in all things. By gathering, they will avoid the desolations. Many other inspired men have told us to come out of Babylon. There is not a spot where the Lord can tarry overnight outside of these valleys of the mountains. The rest of the world is Babylon, in the strictest sense of the word. We should become a distinct people, a peculiar people, a people whom he could use according to his mind and will, 
and through whom he could accomplish his mighty, his marvelous, and his wondrous purposes. That is the object he has had in view in bringing us together in dash to separate us from Babylon. We are called upon as individuals, each of us who form this community, to come out from the wicked world, from Babylon. All those who believe the history given by John, the beloved disciple, know that the time would come when the Lord would call upon all people, who believe in him, delighted to his will, and seek to understand the requirements of heaven, to gather out from the midst of Babylon. John wrote plainly in reference to this gathering and we have believed it. We are called upon to come out from among the wicked, as it is written, Come out of her, O my people, that is, come out of Babylon. What is Babylon? Why, it is the confused world, come out of her, then, and cease to partake of her sins, for if you do not you will be partakers of her plagues. There is no latter-day saint enjoying the light of the Spirit, but what realizes the difficulty of living in Babylon without partaking in some degree of her sins. As well think of handling pitch without being soiled, as to think of joining with the corrupt nations of modern Babylon without being contaminated by the abominations and wickedness that abound on every side. It is also equally certain that the saints could not continue to live in these lands without being sharers in the judgments and plagues that are being poured out, and that will continue in an increasing degree, to vex the nations. Mill Star 47, 251 Oil and water will not mingle, neither the pure principles of righteousness amalgamate with unrighteousness. Consequently, if the will of God is ever done on earth as it is in heaven, the righteous must be separated from the wicked and ungodly. How can Zion be built up, unless the saints gather and build it up? And how can Babylon fall, so long as the saints stay and hold it up? It is not only interesting, but vital, to recognize some of the reasons we should leave Babylon. 1. Temptations of the worldly 2. Wicked environments 3. Evil associations for youth 4. Sustaining wicked men in office 5. False and corrupt education 6. Lack of choice for marriages 7. Influences for unholy practices 8. Lack of protection and good associations 9. Weakening of family ties 10. Deterioration of spirituality 11. Supporting the building up of Babylon 12. Obedience to Gentile law. 13. Participation in worldly competition 14. Being a part of opposition of true saints. 15. In peril of destruction. 16. Disobedience to a commandment. 17. Impossible to be a peculiar people. 18. Fail the test. 19. Wrong burial places. 20. Wrong place in heaven. In 1830 the Lord said, Ye are called to bring to pass the gathering of mine elect. But by 1907 the church decided it was now called to bring to pass the ungathering of the elect. The policy of the church is not to entice or encourage people to leave their native lands but to remain faithful and true in their allegiance to their governments, and to be good citizens. Joseph Fielding Smith explained why the church was building temples in foreign lands, our building of the Rag, and temples is to encourage the saints to stay in their own countries. Picture of Jesus looking out over Jerusalem. 33 and dash, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem. How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings? and you were not. 1907 N-O Utah, Utah How often would I have gathered thy children together, as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and you were not. Social America is called the land of promise. However, that should be used in the past tense, as it is becoming one of the greatest crime capitals in the world. And Salt Lake City and Dash supposed to be a Zion and Dash has become like any other city in the nation. Nearly every Latter-day Saint who arrives in Zion, becomes very disappointed in the conditions they find here. Salt Lake City has a greater crime rate than 10 other cities of its size. Regarding education, Mormons are currently being taught by the textbooks of Babylon. For example, 
Some of our children are taught that our ancestors were little bugs or worms that crawled up out of some swamp and gradually grew legs, stood up and then grew to present maturity. They are taught that prayer is out of place in the schools. The Bible is banned. Religion is considered to be an opiate of people, and yet communism and socialism are frequently taught. National heroes such as Washington, Jefferson, and Ben Franklin are being defamed and replaced. One textbook shows George Washington and Martin Luther King on the same page. And yet, according to FBI reports, King belonged to 32 subversive front organizations. Our leaders have minimized Washington's and Lincoln's birthdays, but they have made a big deal out of Martin Luther King's. America was once a predominantly white and Christian nation, but now they have become full of minorities, each clamoring for equal rights. Los Angeles has more blacks and Hispanics than whites, and many other cities of similar proportions. Race relations are always strained in America. One out of every four blacks in this nation are either in jail or on parole. With all the race riots we have had in good times, what will it be in the bad? Illegal drugs have created one of the largest businesses in this country, and it is expected to get much worse. It is impossible to patrol the entire Mexican border on the southern coastline. Testimony from intelligence officers has revealed that many political leaders in this country are involved in the drug business. Even some military aircraft are used, with immunity from inspection, to bring drugs into this county. Morality in this country continues to get worse at an alarming rate. Marriage is being abandoned and illicit sexual sins are commonplace. Most of the high school boys and girls engage in sexual activities. New York City records more babies there are aborted than are allowed to live. Attempts are being made to prevent abortion clinics. Many people believe there is nothing wrong with killing a little baby, but executing a criminal is terrible. Men all over the country are taking advantage of women. It becomes a conquest for them. Recently on a daytime television show three men bragged about all the women they had seduced. One admitted to nearly 2,000 women. In an interview a few years ago, Julio Iglesias, the noted singer, said he had made love to not less than 3,000 ladies. How can righteous daughters be raised in society with these types of guys around? Added to this, another problem for LDS women is who do they marry? Consider the following alarming statistics. The old statistics were grim enough. But the more recent statement given at this year's Pure Education Week seems even more dismal. For those older than the regular marrying age in the church, there are 14 male Kaizedic priesthood holders for every 100 women. But Babylon has made laws against a man marrying more than one woman. These are just a few examples of how Babylon's social structure is just the opposite to that of God's kingdom. While the saints are living in Babylon, they will be influenced by Babylon. If they are living among true saints they will be influenced by the Lord. Economic instead of carrying out the original intent of Brigham Young and the early pioneers to become as economically independent as possible, the Mormons are steeped in the banking system of Babylon and are dependent on federal notes as the basis of their economy. But how sound is that system? We ought to take a closer look at the American banking system and the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC. We should heed the many warnings, such as that given by Dave Soleil, author and staff researcher for McAlvaney Intelligence. At no time since the Great Depression has the U.S. banking system been in worse condition than it is today, with lower earnings, declining profitability and more bad loans than any time since the 1930s. The ominous condition of American banks should be a warning to all depositors and savers that trouble lies ahead, and all with eyes to see and ears to hear take heed. You must take specific, deliberate steps to insulate yourselves, your families, and your businesses from what may be a repeat of the horror of 1933. As Mormons, we are being deceived again and dash this time regarding our Babylonians' economic system. A picture of our country's banking history presents an important lesson to be learned especially by Latter-day Saints. Obviously, the handwriting is now on the wall. Don't be misled by congressional leaders, the media, or the current administration who want you to believe everything is okay deliberate and decisive action, 
taken immediately, may save you horrible financial loss and leave you able to take advantage of investment opportunities the majority of complacent bystanders who trust the banking system will miss. In Dash Dave Soleil, it has been reported that the savings and loan companies would fail first, then the banks, and after that would be the insurance companies. Banks are now going under and some of the insurance companies have folded. But people put their faith in the economy of Babylon and such organizations as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, FDIC. Soleil reports that in Dash, if just one major money center bank fails, the FDIC insurance fund would be completely wiped out and require a massive federal infusion of cash to make up the shortfall. In fact, Charles Bosher, chairman of the Government Accounting Office recently told Congress that by September the 1st, without another major bank failure, the FDIC will run out of money. The FDIC at present has only 12 to 19 cents insurance for every $100 of insured bank deposits, and is the weakest it has been in its 56-year history. Ebed. With all the warnings the Lord has given in the scriptures, inspired visions and dreams, the Mormons continue to trust in the sinking ship called Babylon. What are we to do? The answer is simple. We are supposed to obey the Lord's economic law and dash the United Order. So why aren't we doing it? Let's go back and review a little history. When the LDS church was less than one year old, the Lord said, I say unto you, be one. And if ye are not one, ye are not mine. Again the Lord said, But it is not given that one man should possess that which is above another, wherefore the world leeth in sin. Since Mormons exhibit great inequalities, they too leeth in sin. What is worse is, the Lord has said, For if ye are not equal in earthly things, ye cannot be equal in obtaining heavenly things. But what is a true Zion? Is Salt Lake City a Zion? We have Zion's Bank, Zion's Motors, Zion's Bookstore, and Zion's Mercantile and Dash but does that qualify as a Zion? Enoch beautifully described Zion when he said, And the Lord called his people Zion, because they were one of one heart and two one mind, and three dwelt in righteousness, and four there was no poor among them. Moses 7.18 Do we live in a society where we are all of one heart? Do we care for the sick, the aged, or help the downtrodden? Do we have a society that are of one mind? Are we in harmony with our thinking, or do we have contention, disputes and lawsuits? Are we dwelling in righteousness, or do we have crime like the rest of Babylon and our jails full of our people? Do we live where there is no poor among us, or do we see street people, soup lines, food stamps and welfare cases all through the state? Obviously we are not Zion, and therefore we are not God's people. In comparing the present Latter-day Saints with the people in the Book of Mormon who had Zion, we learn and dash, and it came to pass that there was no contention among all the people, in all the land. But there were mighty miracles wrought among the disciples of Jesus. And it came to pass that there was no contention in the land, because of the love of God which did dwell in the hearts of the people. And there were no envying, nor strifts, nor tumults, nor whoredoms nor lyings, nor murders, nor any manner of lasciviousness. And surely there could not be a happier people among all the people who had been created by the hand of God. There were no robbers, nor murderers, neither were there Lamanites, nor any manner of ites. But they were in one, the children of Christ, and heirs to the kingdom of God. Since that doesn't describe conditions today, let's try another scenario. And now, in this 201st year there began to be among them those who were lifted up in pride, such as the wearing of costly apparel, and all manner of fine pearls, and of the fine things of the world. And from that time forth they did of their goods and their substance no more common among them. And they began to be divided into classes. And they began to build up churches unto themselves to get gain, and began to deny the true church of Christ. Unfortunately, that sounds more like us. Since the church was organized in 1830, the history of the United Order has gone like this. 1830-1840, attempts were made but it failed. 1860-1890, many attempts were made but eventually they too failed. 1890-1900, the church as a whole has made no further attempts to live it. Out of all the branches and wards of the church today, 
there is not one that is organized in the way God intended. Even in Brigham Young's day he lamented. I sometimes think that I would be willing to give anything, to do almost anything in reason, to see one fully organized branch of this kingdom and dash one fully organized ward. But, says one, I had supposed that the kingdom of God was organized long ago. So it is, in one sense. And again, in another sense, it is not. Wheresoever this gospel has been preached and people have received it, the spiritual kingdom is set up and organized, but is Zion organized? No. Is there even in this territory a fully organized ward? Not one. It may be asked, why do you not fully organize the church? Because the people are incapable of being organized. I can organize a large ward who would be subject to a full organization, by selecting families from the different wards, but at present such a branch of the church is not in existence. It was during the 1860s that they began to establish wards of the United Order in full organization. These little orders were planted from one end of the state to the other, but only a few were very successful. They became a community and were self-sustaining, and they had no poor among them. They were becoming like Enoch's description of a Zion. Each of these successful orders was like a small church within the church. Orderville became so prosperous that they ended up with land in three states equal to one-third the size of the state of Utah. In fact, when President Woodruff signed the manifesto, it was part of an agreement with the federal government to break up the economic system of the Mormons. It was then that the church sent several apostles to break it up with the argument that they were becoming a church within the church. But that is what it was supposed to be. We are brought to a situation in which Brigham Young begged the elders to go out and take the responsibility to start up successful orders that would represent heaven instead of the systems of hell. I have one little sermon to the bishops, Bishop Young and all the rest of them, and to the elders. I want to see a pattern set for this holy order, and I give to each one of them a mission to go and call together five, ten, twenty or fifty families, and organize a complete organization, and show the rest of us how to live. Organizational Chart for Teething and the United Order Spiritual The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, organized to increase the spiritual well-being of the saints, has now become a money-making institution and a huge financial empire with major businesses all over the world. A recent article in the Arizona Republic reported, No religion in America converts spiritual beliefs into financial success like the Mormon Church. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has built a diversified corporate organization that earns or has direct influence in insurance, broadcasting, movie and television production, newspaper publishing, book publishing, satellite communications, private schools, property development and leasing, agriculture, department stores, a tourist attraction, hotels and stocks and bonds. The Church, which claims 7.8 million members worldwide, is among the most rapidly growing and powerful economic institutions in the United States, particularly in the West, where much of its wealth is concentrated. Indeed it has become one of the great corporate structures of Babylon. But if Babylon should fall tomorrow, the Church and its members would fall with it. Herein lies a terrible danger. John the Revelator makes an interesting interpretation of a vision given to him. He saw a woman with twelve stars in her crown and identified her as the Church of God. This corresponds with Paul who also said, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the Church. Therefore as the Church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands. But today the Church is wandering from her husband and fraternizing with Babylon, whom John says is the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. By such associations, she, too, can become like Babylon the harlot, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. The church is portrayed as a feminine entity. As a woman she is supposed to produce children. Those children are supposed to be clean from the sins of the world and living in unity. They should become like Christ in his position as their father, but instead she is burying children who are little Babylonians and dash competing, cheating, stealing and fighting for filthy lucre. She ought to be producing little baby united orders, because Christ said, If ye are not one, ye are not mine.
since we are not one, whose children are we? The church has become like the federal government and dash both the top heavy. Our government has become a huge international system, instead of a small efficient organization confined to 10 square miles in Washington. DC church headquarters has become a huge international system of corporate businesses, land speculation, with stocks and bonds in Babylon. Members are left to fend for themselves. What should we do? Shall we continue to act like illegitimate Babylonian children n born, raised and supported by the kings of the earth? Or should we try to obey the instructions of our real father? President Brigham Young described the condition of the church and its members by saying, Men have said, probably, to all of you who have been out and mingled with the world, it is very well for you Latter-day Saints to talk about your condition now, because you are a primitive people, you are a young community, you have not been tempted and tried. Wait till you increase in wealth, and until you become familiar with the sins which surround the wealthy. Wait until you are brought in contact with luxury. Wait until the spirit of reform which animated your pioneers dies out, and a generation rises up who will think more of the world. Then there will be a different feeling and spirit, and you will not be persecuted, hated or despised. You will become more popular, because the world will become familiarized with your ideas. Then, Mormonism and the Latter-day Saints will become like every other people that have preceded them overcome by the luxuries of the world, and by the love of riches. There are a few faithful souls who will persevere through the temptations, trials and wickedness of this world to be crowned kings and priests unto God forever. It will be a great and glorious day for men and women to be given those keys to become creators of a kingdom of their own. In that day they shall enter into the joy of the Lord to hear him say, Well done thou good and faithful servant, thou hast been faithful over a few things, now you shall rule over many. These will be the elect and dash those who have not been deceived and have not subjected themselves to the ways of Babylon. These are they who have chosen the kingdom of God over all else and because they did, they shall have all things added unto them. Chart of the kingdom of God, but seek ye first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Section IV Conclusion Shortly after the saints arrived in the Salt Lake Valley, they owned their own land, had their own politicians, educators, money system, and were free from bondage. But 25 years later, in his last public address, Brigham Young could see what was happening to the saints and said, And with regard to the conduct of this people and dash if an angel should come here and speak his feelings as plainly as I do, I think he would say, O Latter-day Saints! Why don't you see, why don't you open your eyes and behold the great work resting upon you and that you have entered into? You are blind. You are stupid, you are in the dark, in the mist and fog, wandering to and fro like a boat upon the water without sail, rudder or oar, and you know not whither you are going. If those were his feelings and observations at that time, what would he say today? The prophet Joseph Smith also saw the future condition of the church and told Moses Hancock, You will live to see men arise in power in the church who will seek to put down your friends and the friends of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Many will be hoisted because of their money and the worldly learning which they seem to be in possession of. And many who are the true followers of our Lord and Saviour will be cast down because of their poverty. Members have two choices, one, support the ways of Babylon or two, get out of it. Joseph said to the elders, never put forth your hands again to build up a Gentile city. Brigham Young also warned, any man of this church and kingdom who exerts his influence, strength, and means to promote any community, or to build up any city, except the people and cities of Zion, is exerting his strength and means against the kingdom of God. Is it not my privilege to give this people counsel to direct them so that their labors will build up the kingdom of God instead of the kingdom of the devil? I will quote you a little scripture if you wish, the words of an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ to me. You may think that I saw him in vision, and it was a vision given right in broad daylight said he and dash never spend another day to build up a gentile city but spend your days dollars and dimes for the upbuilding of the son of god upon the earth to promote peace and righteousness and to prepare for the coming of the son of man and he who does not abide this law will suffer loss that is a saying of one of the apostles of the lord jesus christ he said it to me do you want to know his name it is not recorded in the new testament among the apostles 
but it was an apostle whom the Lord called and ordained in this my day, and in the day of a good portion of the congregation, and his name was Joseph Smith, Jr. These words were delivered to me in July, 1833, in the town of Kirtland, Georgia County, State of Ohio. The word to the elders who were there was, Never, from this time henceforth, do you spend one day or one hour to sustain the kingdoms of this world or the kingdoms of the devil, but sustain the kingdom of God to your uttermost. Now, if I were to ask the elders of Israel to abide this, what would be the reply of some amongst us? The language in the hearts of some would be in dash, it is none of your business where I trade. I will promise those who feel thus that they will never enter the celestial kingdom of our Father and God. We are a product of our thinking and our actions. This is true of nearly everything. For instance, if you see something that looks like a duck, it walks like a duck, and it quacks like a duck, chances are it is a duck. This can also apply to the Babylonians. If we look like Gentiles, live with them, do business with them, become educated by them, invest our money with them, honor all their laws, vote for them, build their cities, and even marry them, we, too, must be Gentiles. If we really belonged to Christ and were laboring for Zion, we wouldn't look, speak, or act like Gentiles. How did we get into this mess, and how are we going to get out of it? 1. Putting lamb's blood on our doorstep won't work this time. 2. The federal government will not help us. They are part of the problem. 3. Wall Street and the international bankers won't help us. They are the ones planning for the calamities. 4. Moving to Jackson County, as some are now doing, won't prove to be an escape. 5. Dashing to the temples, which are out of order, will not save us. Varton Featherston said, there will come a period of time where even the elect will lose hope if they do not come to the temples. The world will be so filled with evil that the righteous will feel secure only within these walls. But 8 million Mormons will not fit in the temples. 6. Keeping the word of wisdom, paying teething, and living worthy of a temple recommend will help but it won't provide enough help. 7. In the coming calamities, the church will not have sufficient temporal and spiritual power to save the people. 8. The few patriots in America cannot do it. David Rockefeller said, we don't have to worry about the patriots in this country and dash they don't have enough money to buy tickets to their own programs. 9. Many have thought the ten tribes would come back to help us out. There is no time now to show that it will not be the case. 10. Many more have thought the Indians would come and save us. There are many reasons why I don't believe that either. Jesus said to his twelve, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter you not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. The fact remains that they are lost, which certainly doesn't sound as if they are very well informed as to their identity. And if the apostles and three Nephites have to go teach them, they are not very conversant with the gospel. Actually all twelve tribes were lost. Even today most of them don't know who they are or where they are going. Some people have said that the ten tribes would come back and straighten everything out. They trust that those ten tribes would save the church and the nation. Vain hope. Don't count on the ten tribes to do much for a frame. It is the reverse. Six months after the church was organized, the Lord said, Even so will I gather mine elect from the four quarters of the earth, even as many as will believe in me, and hearken unto my voice. Moses tried to gather Joseph Smith tried the children of Israel too, to gather them too. The promised land planned of promise. In the final setting in order, the two best tribes will be Judah presiding in the old Jerusalem and Joseph presiding in the new Jerusalem. The other tribes will have to come in under their protection and rule. The Lamanites are a part of the house of Joseph. They will come in and take part in the building of the new Jerusalem. We shall assist them. We shall assist them like an older brother taking care of a younger brother. Urson Pratt has clearly pointed this out in the following sermon. And then shall the work of the Father commence, at that day, even when this gospel shall be preached among the remnant of this people. Verily I say unto you, 
In that day shall the work of the Father commence among all the dispersed of my people. What I wish to call your special attention to now, so far as these sayings are concerned, it this and dash the latter-day saints in these mountains never can have the privilege of going back to Jackson County and building that city which is to be called the New Jerusalem, upon the spot that was appointed by revelation through the prophet Joseph, until quite a large portion of the remnants of Joseph go back with us. Now then, here is a work for us, and we have no need to pray the Father to return us to Jackson County until that work is done. We can pray to the Father, in the name of Jesus, to convert these Indian tribes around us, and bring them to a knowledge of the truth, that they may fulfill the things contained in the Book of Mormon. And then when we do return, taking them with us, that they shall be instructed not only in relation to their fathers and the gospel contained in the record of their fathers, but also in the arts and sciences. They will also be instructed to cultivate the earth, to build buildings as we do, instructed how to build temples and in the various branches of industry practiced by us. And then, after having received this information and instruction, we shall have the privilege of helping them to build the new Jerusalem. The Lord says, in dash, they, the Gentiles, who believe in the Book of Mormon, shall assist my people, the remnant of Jacob, that they may build a city, which shall be called the New Jerusalem. Now, a great many, without reading these things, have flattered themselves that we are the ones who are going to do all this work. It is not so. We have got to be helpers, we have got to be those who cooperate with the remnants of Joseph in accomplishing this great work. For the Lord will have respect unto them, because they are the blood of Israel and the promises of their fathers extend to them, and they will have the privilege of building that city, according to the pattern that the Lord shall give. Do not misunderstand me, do not think that all the Lamanite tribes are going to be converted and receive this great degree of education and civilization before we can return to Jackson County. Do not think this for a moment, it will only be a remnant. For when we have laid the foundation of that city, and have built a portion of it, and have built a temple therein, there is another work which we have got to do in connection with these remnants of Jacob whom we shall assist in building the city. What is it? We have got to be sent forth as missionaries to all parts of this American continent. Not to the Gentiles, for their times will be fulfilled. But we must go to all those tribes that roam through the cold regions of the North and Dash British America, to all the tribes that dwell in the territories of the United States, also to all those who are scattered through Mexico and Central and South America and the object of our going will be to declare the principles of the gospel unto them, and bring them to a knowledge of the truth. Then shall they assist my people who are scattered on all the face of the land, and they may be gathered into the new Jerusalem. Will not this be a great work? It will take a good while to gather all these tribe of South America, for some of them will have to come from five to eight thousand miles in order to reach the new Jerusalem. This will be quite a work and yet we shall have to perform it after the city is built. Who will be the ones chosen to help set the house of God in order, to save the Israelites from destruction, and to lead the nations of the earth into the kingdom of God? Joseph of Egypt had two prophetic dreams. In one he was shown eleven shocks of grain that bowed down before his shock. That portrayed his brothers paying homage to him. That was fulfilled when they came down to Egypt to revere him for saving their lives. In the second dream, he saw eleven stars bow down to his star. This was further in time and dash a greater distance and dimension. This relates to all of their descendants in the last days. Consider the prophetic similarity of the present tribes of Israel with the eleven brothers and Joseph in ancient times. Remember the scenario goes something like this. The eleven brothers kicked Joseph out of the household because they didn't believe in his or his father's revelations. They sent him off with the Gentiles. From out of his lowly place he was chosen by the Lord to prepare for famine. Then came the brothers from the north country and brought treasures to buy food. When they learned his identity and favor with the Lord, they sang for joy that they had found their brother. Now from the last revelations added to the doctrine and covenants. And they who are in the north countries shall come in remembrance before the Lord. And their prophets shall hear his voice, and shall no longer stay themselves and they shall bring forth their rich treasures unto the children of Ephraim, my servants. And there shall they fall down and be crowned with glory, even in Zion, by the hands of the servants of the Lord, even the children of Ephraim. And they shall be filled with songs of everlasting joy. Behold, 
This is the blessing of the everlasting God upon the tribes of Israel, and the richer blessing upon the head of Ephraim and his fellows. And they also of the tribe of Judah, after their pain shall be sanctified in holiness before the Lord. The mission of the tribe of Joseph is to prepare for the oncoming catastrophes, just as did Joseph of old. They must prepare a temporal foundation of food and supplies for the famines and judgments that are to come. These noble men of the earth must also take the keys and responsibility of administering all the ordinances and laws of the gospel, thus becoming saviors on Mount Zion in both temporal and spiritual blessings. The following two quotes show the leading role that the descendants of Joseph will have in the future. That element, that drove us away, not, perhaps, the first, but that very element is beginning to follow in our track. What is its policy? The policy, no doubt, is to cease to invade us by force of arms. But another is adopted, more easily accomplished. What is it? Why, we will oil our lips, and smooth our tongues, and ingratiate ourselves into your favor. We will mingle and commingle with you as brothers, and let your way. We will contaminate you, and by pouring wealth into your laps, we will make you indifferent to your God, your faith and your covenants. The object is to destroy those germs of greatness which heaven has planted in our souls, at which they feel alarmed and dash germs of greatness which, if cultivated, will lead us to wield a power to which the nations will have to bow, as the nations had to bow to that Joseph who was sold into Egypt. Joseph less than of Egypt greater than was foreordained to be the temporal saviour of his father's house, and the seed of Joseph are ordained to be the spiritual and temporal saviours of all the house of Israel in the latter days. The descendants of Joseph are different from the descendants of the other eleven tribes. They are the product of a great prophet who obeyed the fullness of the laws and ordinances of the Lord. The other eleven sons received only a portion of those revelations. Today, in all probability, those who obey or who are willing to obey all of God's laws are descendants of Joseph. Those who accept only a part of the gospel probably belong to one of the other tribes. This is a key to what is happening in the church today. Those who honor all of God's laws are being rejected by their own brethren. The tribe of Joseph may go to jail, as Joseph did. They may be given over to the Gentiles, as Joseph was. Those eleven tribes may reject the revelations that God had given, just as they did anciently. But someday the descendants of Joseph will be given their rightful place to rule over the other tribes and nations, just as did Joseph. If you are a true descendant of Joseph, you will feel the need and urgency to prepare for the kingdom of God.